So, Paul, just to give your uh, voice a rest, and I think we do have water, so somebody was getting it, so maybe if you bring it up. Um, I'm going to throw first to Emma and to Rob. From what you heard from Paul and the diagram of sort of all that mess in the policy process, do you think that's what occurs in Australia as well? Do you think this is consistently an international problem as opposed to a, a UK one? Certainly my experience would, would back it up, that it's, it is messy and it's complicated. Um, we also are fortunate to have local councils, state governments and federal governments. And so in relation to policy, it gets even messier and the federation of states and who's deciding what. Um, policy change is more difficult because of that confederation of states as well. So I think it is consistent. I, I guess the, the overarching message from a uh, researcher perspective is that Whilst it's nice to know what Paul knows, um, it can be deflating and there is a role for people who actually don't know that, don't know it's messy and are just insisting that they have a bit of really good evidence and that other people should listen to it. So there's also there's it that, that it, it's depressing when people don't listen but the insistence that this is good evidence, that it's important, that it should be informing policy is something that you have to hold on to. And if you get too depressed by the complexity of it and the, and the messiness of it, you might lose that and you might lose the, I guess, the passion that you have to defend that bit of good evidence. So I'm wondering why I'm still feeling a bit peppy after that talk. I, I mean, obviously Paul was very nice about it, but that messy complexity, I suppose, is... I, sorry, I should just say this morning I woke up and I went, I'm supposed to be on a, be on a panel about policy, but... I know almost nothing about policy and have even less experience than that. Um, but in terms of, um, I, I suppose it's good to know that it's messy, but to also know that it's not necessarily designed to thwart us completely. Because I think a lot, a lot of people do feel that really the system's there com completely to, to prevent any change and to prevent and to thwart um, evidence-based, you know, adoption of evidence. I suppose. So that that was encouraging, and I think. Um, in a in a kind of backdoor kind of a way, uh, Paul's given us a, a bit of hope. And I guess on that sense, that that's a piece around. It's not personal. It's not about you. It's about them. So so don't get too upset when they don't listen to what you have to say. Um, which is kind of interesting, uh, Paul, in your point around that a lot of these preferences might be influenced by ideological sort of backgrounds. And so how do we reconcile that piece around? Uh, you know, fitting the evidence to what you ideologically believe in because some of that is absolutely about somebody um, being blind to an alternative because of those values that underpin what they believe. Well, uh, I mean, the thing is, some of the things I think might work, they're not well researched, you know, so I, 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 guess, I guess I can say what I like, you know, because people can't prove me wrong yet. But um, I think there's a, there's a lot of work on... I think the trend is towards uh, storytelling and using a kind of Aristotle type approach, you know. So um, oh, I need to remind me. So there's um, there's a, like which what order is it? Well, there's pathos would be kind of appeal to you know the you know empathy of an audience. Logos would make it make a, a kind of uh, your rational argument. And uh, hang on, which one? Logos, this, uh, eight, uh, which, that one off uh, was the. It has to be a credit. A credible speaker, you know, and that's. I think people, I think, are used thinking that's the that's the science advice the communication way, credible, rational, and uh, you know, taps into the emotions. I, I I think there's more value to what uh, you know Riker calls heresthetics, and I wish he'd called it something else, right? But heresthetics would be essentially people maintain many contradictory beliefs. And the trick is, which of those beliefs do they pay most attention to at a particular time? Um, and there's a there's a double layer there because that's how you would sum up governments. Governments contain policies that contradict each other. So often the 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 aim in, in policy making is to get people to energetically implement some of those um, aims and to not pay attention to the others. So you're not trying to change minds there. You're just trying to reinforce some beliefs and downplay others. And I think that's the so that. You know that that could be seen as manipulative, you know, but I think it's just a kind of good agenda-setting exercise where you recognise that people's views are are quite fixed, 
but that they have so many of them, they, 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 hard, they, they find it hard to be consistent, to apply them consistently. Mm. Good answer. On that um, manipulation piece, because it's come up a couple of times in the audience and also mentioned here, I'm wondering, Emma and Rob, if you, uh, where you sit on that, do you feel like it's manipulation if you have used a particular skill to get a particular outcome? Uh, what does that look like and feel like for you two? I guess the the answer, and I and again, I'm bringing it back to potentially practical things that researchers can do within a university context in terms of influencing policy in a, in a way that would be acceptable and still manipulative. Uh, and I think that is looking for opportunities for gathering evidence that is needed in a particular situation. So you might see that there is plenty of evidence that smoking causes cancer, et cetera, et cetera. People aren't changing the policy. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting a local bit of evidence as we know that people are changed by information about the people they live and work with. The same for almost any policy. Uh, and many times I have known from the literature and from my own meta-analyses and reviews the result of a particular contaminant and what, what effect it might have in a coastal environment, but I have still gone out, engaged with government and industry, found that extra bit of local evidence, and it's at that point that the policy changes. Um, people have ownership of that bit of knowledge. It comes from their part of the world. Um, and if that's being manipulative, well, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to do it. it. It does mean that you're, as a person who's trying to influence policy and, and have evidence-based policy, it may not be that you're always at the absolute cutting edge of the research because you're actually getting a bit of local knowledge. It's almost like doing citizen science with industry and with government in order to, to get that ownership of knowledge. But it's a valuable thing to do and depending on your heuristics and how you define knowledge, it could be considered new. It's not going to get you a science paper. That's the problem. And I think that's where we have a values issue here. The university now has a very strong uh, focus on our academics having social engagement, global impact and leadership. And that's that's a really positive thing. And it's going to balance out um, our need to be absolutely at the cutting edge of creating new knowledge because sometimes we're just synthesising or we're finding a bit of local information. Um, before you pass to Rob, I'm just going to just, gonna just ask you a quick follow-up on that point about that incentivization structure. So we know that the universities change promotion processes so that impact is counted now, which is actually really key. I mean, as a dean, do you have other suggestions as how we might incentivize researchers so that actually we can help people um, take the time to prioritise having an impact and not just uh, achieving those other traditional metrics? Yeah, sure. But, you know, part of it would be about developing new metrics, of course. And, you know, that's kind of the go-to solution of it gets really, really messy. If the policy process is that messy, then imagine trying to get the one-size-fits-all metric to indicate that you've had an impact on that policy process. That's what's really dif difficult. So I think what it is about is uh, establishing a, a culture of recording your active engagements and and telling your own story about how your research has has changed policy, looking for evidence of those, um, your own papers being cited in um, legal documents, for example, court cases, um, actually writing submissions for Senate inquiries on particular issues. And I know many of our researchers actually do this already, but it's not a consistent thing. It's not something that um, people are going out of their way to do. Part of it is identifying those activities and saying these are legitimate impact activities. You know, when we look at your promotion applications, we will, we will check, have you done this, you know? Um, but we won't solely put impact and engagement into that single box because the more we constrain it, the fewer options you will have to engage in this messy process and make a change. So going back, the original question had to do with manipulation and I... So in my own research, which has a lot to do with sex and the complicated questions that's around sex and gender and reproduction, reproductive rights, etc., cetera, um, I think you've got to be very, very careful that you don't simply look at, you know, what is that, the outcome that we want? What is the, um, the change to the way that people uh, view the world or understand what it means to be alive that you would like to see because you believe that that has some kind of... Um, 
you know, salutary um, effect on the way that people will then treat each other um, and then retrofit or, or pick what evidence you want because there is so much evidence out there um, to suit that because you can guarantee that people who have different ideological views will do the same thing. There's a tremendous amount of simply gathering up, you know, um, evidence ornaments to adorn whatever ideological view you want to push. So, you know, I, 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 none of that work of mine goes anywhere near near policy or, or trying to change, um, you know, decision makers thinking, because really what I think is much more important is showing normal people, showing regular people, how to live in a world of complex, um, often contradictory claims and evidence. And I think we're, we're nowhere near far enough. It's, it's not, you know, it's not over, overly cautious, I think, to just say, first, we should understand ourselves. Um, what we do, how, what, what should university people do? I think folks in uh, researchers should probably follow some form of the, uh, of the same um, uh, approach, which is, you know, don't just push for the outcome that you want. Uh, you really have to try and be as fair as possible uh, with the evidence. Um, so we're busy trying to revise um, what the university is going to do about thought leadership. This word thought leadership crops up everywhere in the strategy 2025. And, you know, to many people, it sounds like corporate babble. Um, it sounds like, you know, somebody with a website who thinks they're quite important and one day wants to give a TED talk. And it is. It's a lot of it's like that. But it's all through the strategy. And there's people, you know, in, in this university and in all sorts of universities who get together and they think it sounds really, really smart, like, like an airport lounge. Um, and it doesn't. Um, so, so we thought, well, you know, we can argue about what terms mean and should we go back to public intellectuals, which has its own problems. And we thought, no, what we'll just do is at UNSW, we're going to try and own this term. We're going to try and tell the world what thought leadership means, or at least what it means to us. So this is the first time anyone will hear this in public. Um, it's a very, very long definition. But anyway, um, we just thought that perhaps, that perhaps the pithiest thing we could come up with is that we need to put thought and leadership actually together. It's not out of utopia, honestly. Um, and just say it's leadership in the public interest, and that's really important, including discerning what the public interest is, based on critical thinking and evidence-based thought. And that can involve persuading, or it can involve promoting an idea, or developing an idea, or it can involve encouraging and exhorting and inspiring people. But we still need to remember that we are trying to both discern the public interest and uh, to do it with critical thinking and with evidence and with a fair and reasonably disinterested treatment of the evidence. So I think I took us backward. Mm. I think I think that's um I think that's an interesting definition. I might come back to the thought leadership kind of piece and how that marries up to what people can practically do. I want to come back just for a second to the incentivization structures. Paul, at your university, are researchers rewarded for having an impact on policy? What does that look like? So there's um, there's a movement in the UK to uh, so we have uh, what well, we call it in the UK the research excellence framework every seven years. Uh, universities are assessed so that we can be put in a league table of excellence in research. And um, it used to be primarily the research environment and the outputs. We used to be uh, measured primarily in terms of four outputs every seven years. Now there's a, an impact component that's about uh, you know 20% of the total. And it doesn't sound too much 20%, but actually in some cases, like uh, if I'm in a department of 12, then uh, we need two case studies and 25 outputs. And actually, the, the so a, a case study for me, a four-star case study, would be better for my career than the publications, I think, now. Uh, now, that's not, this, that's not the same for everyone. Uh, some people can ignore it, but some people could take, you know, take a disproportionate incentive from it. But the tricky thing is the way, imp the way impact is defined is essentially uh, its impact related to research publication. So, you know, you're saying... You have to give up some of that uh, work to make an impact. This measure is you have to do both of those things and, and essentially you have to produce the work first and then have the impact with it. So they've kind of built in a, an incentive to do it, but 
but they've also built in a sense that this is a highly linear process and that you do research and then you make a, a clear tangible impact from it. So uh, if you can ignore the kind of unintended consequences, there are incentives that universities, I think when we were appointing people, we were looking at their impact potential in their CVs. If uh, in promotions um, criteria, you know, are they making a wider contribution? It's, it's a big part of it. I mean, I, I won't lie and say it, it, it's the, um, it has replaced research as the, the big thing. You know, it's still grants and publications, but, uh, you know, impact could tip, tip the balance between two similar candidates or it could make the difference between an application. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think it has made a difference. It's interesting. I think one of the great assets that we have as academics is that we get to marry up them both. And in working with government, with corporates, with not-for-profits, with philanthropists, with social enterprises, I find that the value that we have by having the academic outputs is that the rigour is there. And they know that we have ridiculous promotions processes and all sorts of nasty peer review processes that if you don't have the rigour, you won't survive. And so what you can do in terms of those accessible outputs that you then create, you know, you might have the great journal article, you turn that into something and you need to ask yourself, is it usable? Is it useful? What would somebody actually do with this if they were going to create some kind of change? And you turn that into another output and that's the bit that's going to have traction. And it's trusted because you also have the other academic hat. Would would that be your experience? That's my experience in the social sciences, in, in, in the social policy and also in sort of, I guess, the social business landscape. Would that also play out in the sciences? Absolutely. It, it often, it doesn't play out in another peer-reviewed publication. Um, it, yeah, it plays out in a technical report or a government report or, or you acting as an advisor um, to a government agency. And I think that that's, that's hugely powerful. You've got a level of respect and gravitas. Um, there is an expectation that what you say will be evidence-based uh, and that does give slightly more weight sometimes. It doesn't mean the final decision is, is weighted towards you. It means that your contributions in those, uh, in those fora uh, and also within those documents can be very, very powerful. Um, so I've, I've played a number of different ways of influencing policy and some of, it, some of it has been through creating the primary evidence base but others have been through sitting on these advisory panels and writing the summative reports for example the technical reports writing the coast of australia state of environment report you know that kind of component can be incredibly powerful we have a, another example at csi we every 12 months let out a change collection piece and we take something that we know industry wants to understand better and we do all of the background academic work and we turn it into a background you know maybe a hundred page report that nobody sees but we make sure the rig is there and we turn that into a little accessible a5 booklet that is all about what does this mean for industry and we've got examples um and some of my colleagues have led these jack included who's in the room um, we've got examples on uh, how do you measure impact. We've got one on collaboration. Jack's designed a collaborative health assessment tool that goes alongside that. So all the academic work sits behind it. But actually, as far as the collaborations that are happening around how do we influence and help people who are trying to address problems on the ground, they can take the tool and then see how they're doing as a collaboration. Um, and just turning things that we do into things that are actually usable and, and useful to get some traction. So on that note, I'm going to take your frame, persuade and tell stories and add some questions that you might want to use and think about in working with government, corporates, not-for-profits, whoever your target industry might be. In that frame piece, and, and I'm, you know, Paul, let me know if you think these are useful or not and or whether you have other things to add to them. I think the core question is why does this matter? And as academics, we should be doing that anyway around the work that we do because if you can't answer why does this matter, it's actually really bloody hard to get a grant application up or get an abstract in. But actually so often when we review things, you'll notice that why does this matter is missing from there. And that's key in the frame. On the persuade piece, I would argue that you probably, it's useful to understand a whole bunch of things, but three things that I've found enormously useful Find out what someone's values are. And if you know what their values are, you then know which buttons might actually work in terms of what you need to press. And it's interesting because in some of our work that we do on 
housing and homelessness, for example, if I know that somebody's got a neoliberal uh, ideology, then I will know, and it's almost having your kit bag of evidence, Emma. It's not. It's all about the quality of the evidence, but actually I'll pull out the kit bag that says, you will save X dollars if we invest in this because actually it's cheaper to pull this person off the streets than to leave them there. Um, so the values piece I think matters. And the other one is what are their KPIs? What's their strategy? I sit on the Premier's Council for Homelessness in New South Wales. And one of the things that I constantly use in my kit bag in those kinds of examples and also in other, you know, federal um, and local council kind of government conversations and also with CEOs of industry is if this is your strategy, how are you going to achieve this if this, this and this is going on? Or call them on, do you really mean this? So frame, why does it matter? Two, find out what people's values and KPR or KPIs and strategies are. And then finally, in the tell stories, work out how you connect the heart and the head. And if you can do the storytelling with the evidence, um, it can be enormously powerful. Those are my sort of three kind of key ideas to add to your three list. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's good to me. Uh, so I'm going to just qualify a little bit, but... I don't want to get, I, I keep getting things backwards, you know, I start with the problems. But so, I mean, I think actually, as described, those are the skills that academics have, aren't they? The, um, th that's the process you go through when you write an article for an academic audience. You have to explain why it matters to them, work out what the reference points are and, 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 and fit them or else you'll get a, a terrible re review. You know? So it's not, I, th I think it's not too difficult to think about using those skills for a wider audience, I think. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, I suppose the only two, uh, okay, give me two caveats. One is, um, so I do work on things like uh, prevention, early intervention, and, and you can generate a kind of superficial cross-party um, consensus based on making it appeal to different people for different reasons. So um, people on the left like prevention, early intervention, because it can reduce inequalities. People on the right like it because it can reduce public service costs. And, you know, it sounds like a, a great recipe for, for collaboration until you have to, you know, turn those broad aims into uh, particular um, uh, strategies. And I think that's the kind of research I do suggest there are problems there. But, uh, okay, um, the, the second thing would be there's some interesting work going on by organizations who are trying to work out, measure the impact of these stories. So the thing that always struck me was there's this, uh, the Frameworks Institute, uh, which is worth looking at, because essentially they say, the same story can have a, a perfect impact or the opposite, depending on the audience. So if you if you tell a story about healthy eating and lack of poor a lack of choices for healthy eating in the population, and you 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 trying to get people to uh, empathise with a, say a young a young mother with you know with young children, so, um, then a kind of centre left audience will think, okay, I really sympathise there. We've got to do something. And a kind of centre right audience says, you know, I would have made better choices no sympathy you know that's that's a, that's a poor you know uh you know yeah you know, you're not convincing me and they're working with this uh, they're trying to compare that with a more thematic type approach where they're they're they use kind of like a, a maze analogy so they say well if this is about choice if you think they're just making bad choices then we'll show you we'll take you through a maze and you have to make these poor choices along the way and i think so there are different levels of stories you know some of them will really work really quickly and, and you're successful but some of them are really kind of tricksy and complicated and it's a real kind of real skill and i think that's back to your earlier point in your presentation about the importance of different language and different approaches for different groups mm. um so back to the framing and and i think all the techniques that you're talking about really resonate with the way that i've had influences on policy a, a lot of the time it's about also we've talked about identifying people's values it's it's also about identifying people's what people think are the main threats to those values um and the the two can be the values can be distinct and people's perception of what the threats are to those values can be distinct as well so you've got this terrible matrix and crossover um in, in the environmental sciences people's idea of what the major threats are can be completely different to what the scientific consensus is on the threats. Um, and so the situation is you can either spend many, many decades trying to convince everybody of what the actual threats are, which, you know, by that time 
the damage is done or you can align the perception of what people what people think is the major threat with what you know is the underlying mechanism mechanistic cause um, and that's trickier it means that it's a it's you probably at the same rate convince people because by the time you've gone through this process they're actually working out what the real threat is but you get much more effective action much more quickly um, an example would be debris uh, new south wales population in fact the entire australian population but i know the data for new south wales uh, think that um, visual debris big bits of you know waste or plastic bottles those sorts of things is the major threat to the marine coastal environment now it is a threat um, it's arguably not the major threat at all to the marine and coastal environment but it is if i can draw a causal pathway for that and where that comes from it's linked to what the major threats are which you know are agricultural change that increase the nutrients and and increase the sedimentation into our estuaries it's a habit, habitat loss and it and it actually reflects also the fact that there's a lot of storm water coming in and a lot of that has got microplastics which the population can't see but are probably one of the major threats so if i can just go okay I'm going to I'm going to trust you that the debris is the big threat. I can th see it aesthetically is a threat to the value of the beauty of that location as well. I'll take it as a, an indicator of an ecological threat and let's work on that. Let's work on mitigating and reducing that macro debris problem. In the meantime, I'm going to align all these other things that reduce impacts um, that I know are ecological impacts with that policy process. And so in a way it's a bit manipulative as well, but it's good for the environment, so justifying it. I used to feel really guilty about having the ability to manipulate in those kinds of situations as an academic because it feels disingenuous um, or it felt to me to be disingenuous. And then I actually reconciled that I was working for purpose. And so as long as I was doing it for social good and for public good, then actually um, I should just harness it and use it and actually be more influential in the world. And so um, it's, a, it's a tricky, I, th I understand that it's a tricky thing to balance. <laughs> I don't know that I, well, yes, no, I don't, I don't think I can go there. Just the one thing I'm, I'm interested in how the other panelists handle this is that it's not often not the public that we need to convince or that you need to turn around. It's often commercial interests. So in, in diet, for example, in anything to do with food at all, you know, it's all very well to have a professorship at a university. But if you've taken money from Nestle or one of the big food companies, you're not the same authority that you are if you've never touched that money before. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, the fossil fuel lobby has tried to do the same thing with um, actually, with government research grants, you know, if you've got if you've got money from the government to study something like climate change, then suddenly you're tainted by the fact that that your research is motivated by the public interest in a perverse kind of a way. Uh, obviously, you aren't, but they've certainly tried to make that argument. So I don't know how you handle that that particular conflict uh, where you're really up against a big, sophisticated PR machine that's been trying this stuff since at least Big Tobacco. Um, so, you know, as many of you out here are probably researchers within the university, the first thing I would say is the grants management office are really good at giving advice on this um, and they can actually make sure that your contracts that you're getting with industry partners um, ensure that your independence is, is clear and that your right to publish is clear and that your ownership of intellectual property coming in is clear. We also have, you know, a whole team of people who will defend you from um, attacks if they are not you know evidence-based we have a clear process of doing that um, so in one sense you've you've got as a professor or as an academic within a university you do have that suite of support um, but the inferences that can be made are really damaging even if you have the professional um, support from your institutions and i think i think that's the critical um, debate here i uh, I have tried very, very hard and I play an advocacy role for science and technology as president of Science and Technology Australia, so I'd have to do this in this role as well of um, only speaking from an evidence base and trying to do it from a nonpartisan position. Um, so at trying to be a non-value laden person, which is obviously impossible, but the more you try it, the more you become a trusted person and it's actually very, very difficult to um, attack that that trust. Um, 
yeah, I mean that that's that's always going to come falling down if people are making a concerted effort to undermine you. That's where you need professional support and professional background. And I do do that work as president of Science and Technology Australia. If we see a scientist or a science evidence um, platform being attacked by a private interest or by a government interest, we will defend the right of that scientist to um, to speak out, and we will also critique. The, the people who are making their criticism and try and identify the reason why they're making that criticism. So, I mean, I think it's, it's a big effort to defend evidence in many cases and that's just some of the ways we do it. I, I'd agree with everything that Emma's just said and I'd probably add a couple of things. I think it's, it's actually, it becomes really tricky. I mean, I don't know how many different um, funding types I've had, I don't know, 40, 50 funding partners across government, corporates, not-for-profits, et cetera, but actually the way that, and, you know, and millions of dollars. And so I think the key thing is, one, yeah, how you set it up. So using grant offices, using IP, making sure that um, you hold hold the IP so that you can be the one that actually says if your partner doesn't like the answer, you don't change the answer. Um, it's not their work and they're not endorsing it. Um, they're just helping to fund it. But then also having an understanding of where your thresholds might sit. So, for example, we had a conversation, um, Lindsay, who's in the room, and I, who's from CSI, last week about whether we would take um, money off a particular philanthropist who happened to um, have a whole lot of wealth from gambling. And our answer in the social space is no, because actually for us, you know, we're trying to address issues around homelessness, we're trying to address issues around poverty and significant vulnerability and place-based disadvantage and we know that that is actually one of those things around perpetuating the problem. Saying that, we've got partnerships with people in the housing business um, who are making money off property development, development and we're trying to address homelessness. But that is in recognition of if we're serious about fixing some of these complex problems, we can't do it on our own and we can't just rely on government to fix it. And so some of that is about how do we actually engage with corporates, bring them along and work out who's playing what role and be open and willing enough to call them on stuff in the room. So if you're serious about this, you've got to stop perpetuating X, Y, Z. Or if you're serious about this, then you have to be okay with me saying X, Y, Z. Or we've got a report coming out next week and I've had some feedback back from the industry partner on that and the comment was, we don't think this particular part should be in the report. And my response to that is, well, actually, it's a key lever and it's a key structural problem of why we have this issue and it's staying. Um, and actually, you can either choose to remove your logo from the report. You're not an author. Do you want us to tighten up the disclaimer? And, you know, the report will come out with that section in it next week. So I think it's, it's tricky but, um, but I think it's working out, for me, it's working out where those thresholds sit. Yeah, on a couple of things. I like, I like the way you describe trying to be non-partisan because I, I, like um, I like the idea that if you're a scientist, you can project science strategically, you know, because you know that people trust scientists. They have a particular image of scientists that they're somehow objective and, you know, I like the idea of if someone knows that and they say, oh, okay, you know, they use the kind of post-truth language if, if it works, you know, if it helps their agenda, that sort of thing. Um, and I spend a lot of time in the, the conferences I described trying to work out if people use that kind of language of objectivity be because they believe it or because they know that it might have some traction. And, and it, you know, imagine they can use the same language and, and, and it can be a uh, really naive or really sophisticated strategy. You know, I like, I like to think it's the, it's the latter for most people. Uh, the other one, I think there's a real kind of, um, uh, I guess, disciplinary difference in connections with industry. So I think the classic would be any kind of tobacco control. If, uh, if a researcher has a link with tobacco industry, it's a career killer or else it's a credibility killer. You know, you just, um, and, it, and it still continues with, uh, you know, say, e-cigarettes debates just now. I think, you know, the, the, the quickest way for a scientist to try and discredit another scientist is to show any links they've had with any kind of private funding to an extent that's, that's, very, that's hard to find in almost any other field, maybe apart from, you know, alcohol or, um, uh, you know, other kind of, uh, uh, kind of I was going to say kind of sin, sin area, um, would be kind of healthy behaviour, public health stuff. 
Whereas it's much more routine to work with business in things like engineering, where it's about you know technology development and working with huge companies with resources. You know, so, I mean that's one I think where people need kind of good mentoring advice to know what the rules are, because if you, you because you know if you don't know the rules, you're either boosting your career fantastically or, or killing it with one one choice. Um, I want to throw to the floor for questions for the panel. Uh, while the hands are going up and you're thinking about it. Uh, there's one at the front here in the black shirt. Um, I'll, I'll let you ask the question and then I'll come back to my question. Um, so sort of like in the light of sort of climate change and the need for rapid change in policy, and the sort of strong impact is sort of bigger than ever before. And with sort of corporates having significant play over policy in Australia, like coal dependency and lockout laws, sort of avoiding the star. Um, thinking about that and the power plays to creating policy change in Australia, what are the biggest levers to make and are they in government or corporate sectors? Sorry, I got lost in the preface to the question and so didn't quite understand the actual question. So can... So I think it really depends on the topic and how you've created the knowledge in the first place. My, I think the fastest way to change uh, corporate activity is to create knowledge with them um, based on questions that they have but based on your own rigorous scientific model of creating that knowledge. And usually by the time you've got the data way before it's published, it's already influencing how they're doing things either how they're manufacturing or how they're um, dealing with a waste product or, or anything like that. Um, same with government. I find if you can get into the government agencies and co-develop, co-define the research problem with your partner, um, bring them along for the ride of collecting the data. Again, it's a bit like citizen science. Before you've even published, you've, you've got policy change happening. Um, they're not necessarily saying it's because of what they've found, but it's already embedded in their new world view. Um, but obviously, so that's the that's the most rapid way, but it's also one of the hardest because you have to have the trust of the people that you're working with. You you have to, you know, be really, really able to spend the time working with them. It takes longer to produce the information, but it's more more quickly taken up. Um, when it comes to information that you've already got and then you're trying to create rapid change, um, that takes that takes a, a, a village. You know, you, you shouldn't think of yourself as being able to create new policy by yourself. I think that's when you start to act on a social change and you think about who are all the players in this policy change process, how do I influence each one of those, what are their values, aligning those values, and it, and it becomes quite quite complicated. But we've got very, you know, amazing people who do this on a regular basis. Um, Richard Kingsford, for example, in the water space, uh, Anne Williamson here in, in transport and road safety, um, you know, these people are, are experts at working within that very large ecosystem of people that it takes to change policy. Um, well, I would agree with everything Emma said. And interestingly, Jack and I run um, workshops with the New South Wales Police Force, some of their most senior leaders, and they bring in people from interstate as well. But as part of that, and then also some other training that we do, we run um, workshops on how you think about the ecosystem. If, you, if you've got one of those really complex, sticky problems that you're trying to change, and who is sits within that and who you should actually be spending your time working with. Um, because so, so often with those things around let's form coalitions, sometimes the coalitions in involve the wrong people. Um, and, you know, and also from the leadership perspective, you also don't want to get stuck in factions where you're fighting with one against the other. And so that piece around how do I better understand that system who's in it and where those levers are for change and in what order is really important as to who you choose to go with and whether it's industry and government or everyone together or philanthropy and corporates. Um, it, it completely, you're right, it depends on the problem. I mean, an interesting example, and then I'm going to throw to Gemma, an interesting example around sort of industry funding versus influencing government is a piece of research that we have done with the National Australia Bank on um, financial inclusion and financial resilience in Australia, which we've been doing for the last decade or so, um, it's like it's pulled up and cited as part of the Royal Commission. And so, you know, we've had work that actually, you know, from that perspective of, oh, God, don't touch their money, 
um, under the conditions of which how do we do this and hold our integrity, it, it can have some significant influence and it's something that government departments have picked up and helped to inform another partnership that we formed across the country called the Financial Inclusion Action Plan where we've got the federal government, we have um, one of the biggest not-for-profits in that uh, microfinance space, Centre for Social Impact and Ernest & Young form a collaboration around how do we bring on board a whole bunch of people from across the country, including all the big banks, insurance players, telecoms, energy providers, not-for-profits and say, what would it look like if you developed a financial inclusion action plan so you played your part in fixing this problem? And UNSW is also, also has a, a financial inclusion action plan as well. And so I agree, it depends on the problem. There are ways that you can do that and think about, well, where is this ecosystem at and, and how do we actually think differently about who we pull together and when and what's the evidence that you pull up at what time points to, to do that. My question is for Paul. Um, so in Australia, Paul, we have had a pretty systematic disinvestment in the skills and capabilities of the public sector, which has led to reliance on consultants to really do a lot of the core work of government. I know there's a bit of a shift to consultants in the UK, probably not as extensive as it is here, but do you have any thoughts on what that means for how academics go about engaging now with government? Oh, because they have to engage more with the consultants instead of the, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, um, well, let me say something positive, right. Uh, uh, the, I, th I think the, the, the issue of the kind of traditional system was the key advice is build up relationships with civil servants. Uh, but also the advice would be they probably turn or you they'll probably change their positions every 18 months. So you're, you're, it might take you 17 months to build up a good relationship and you get a solid month of you know, the, good, the good things happen. Now I guess with consultants, maybe, maybe there's a possibility that if they are more they are floating, but they're more permanent. I guess cons these consultants are are more specialist, and they don't they're not generalists moving around. So that, I think for me, my instant thought was that means that I can build a relationship with these consultants that will be around for much longer, and uh, knowing that they will have this 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 um, influential part of the process. Does that sound feasible? Yeah. I I think the the kind of sorted answer is be the consultant um, and so I think it does open up opportunities for academics to tender for these jobs um, and arguably do a much much better job than the consultant might do if you are managing to do it in a as a research project um, and as a not-for-profit research project because you can put all the resources that you get into that um, and produce a really rigorous and useful report um, so first of all by all means, I think we should be taking advantage and much more than we have already about being that consultant. Um, the second thing I would say is uh, it it increases the value of those um, syntheses that we write, you know, our, our evidence-based review papers that we do. Um, they already have value, uh, but it's different between different disciplines, but incredible value to influence um, consulting work because the consultants are looking for a quick review that's already done of that particular topic. So if you can foresight and you can say, well, I really want change in this particular space based on evidence, I'll do a review in that space and make it publicly available. I'll send it to all the consultants who I think might be interested in or tendering for these types of jobs. You'll all of a sudden find that most of your material is in the introduction to their report. So, you know, not always properly cited, but anyway, um, that's a good way to influence. Can I ask just on that? I'm I'm not, I'm not sure the feel, but um, there there are these kind of consultant type contracts that UK and Scottish governments give out that academics can, can bid for in that kind of way, and I think uh, it's just right. Um, we're still recording, aren't we? I was trying, I don't want to reveal too much of the details, but I, I think the instinct of our university and colleagues who have done one of them is to not touch any of the small contracts because they're just they're, they're, it's a horrible amount of work for a small amount of funding compared to the big grants you would have an incentive to go for. So I think that partly explains why more independent researchers fulfill and, and get those contracts because they have more of an incentive to do it uh, if it's the same as the UK. And um, some of them, I've met some people who, who work in that kind of field and they're, I would say, I mean, I guess some of them are going to be kind of horrible um, yeah, the worst excesses of, 
of humanity. But um, some of the people I've met who do these kind of research type consultancies are fantastically agile. You know, they because they're they have to generate income to make a living. They they they, they don't they don't mess around in a way that I mean not not you know some academics would do. You know, they're, they're far less comfortable. And so, therefore, they're much more focused, and they so they, they can meet these deadlines, and they don't worry too much about um, uh, you know having a, a sense of completeness before they'll, they'll be willing to say anything. You know, they know that the, the, if they don't say something at the right time, then then they won't get the next contract. I think the other thing to say about the consultancy piece, I mean, it is, it's a really competitive environment. There are more people playing in that space. Um, but I think the other thing as far as the value goes for universities, I mean, you can, you can actually, it means that you can work in quite big teams because you can pull together people across disciplines, pitch for work um, and offer far more value in terms of the rigour that sits behind it. And when we don't win those contracts against consultants who will do something much quicker and sort of, Dirtier is not necessarily fair um, while we're recording, but um, <laughs> but the uh, and then actually you don't want the work, right? So if you miss out on it, you don't want that work because it's actually they're not after what you can give them, and so I think it's holding that that line. And then so I love the idea that you know, and we do lots of work in the category two to three grant space. And um, for me, it's great because we have a fantastic team. We get to reach out to other teams and other people across universities or other faculties and pull together an amazing group of experts who can do incredible work in a really short period of time because there's a, a team of people that's pulling together. I guess a bit like a science lab but on speed and um, without it being in a, a single location. The other thing that's really great is for early career researchers, it provides the most fantastic pathway to future Category 1 grants and it is fan been fantastic for promotion applications. And so for career development opportunities, um, I think that that's been an asset. This is a great discussion. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to applaud you on this idea of entrepreneurship and that way of finding out the values and the interests that are going to peak with people when you're pitching to different people. I just wanted to ask all the panel about the issue of duplication of effort. And this is something that happens all the time in the STEM sector, particularly around issues like STEM education, where there are so many complementary activities happening and quite often duplication of effort, which is slowing down change. Have you got any ideas about how um, researchers can actually help synthesise in a better way the existing effort as more money is being spent? Um, I, I guess there's two things in that question. One is around duplication of research effort and then the other one duplication of maybe like teaching effort or activity effort or whatever that might look like. And also corporate investment in, so, in solutions. Yeah. Duplication is just a big problem everywhere, I think, across all different disciplines and, and fields. We teach a governance for social impact course for board directors of not-for-profits. And one of the things that we do within that is try and teach people how you lift your gaze. So if your goal is to actually improve, you know, women in STEM, how do you lift your gaze to say that's the purpose and who else is working in this space and how might we pull the right people together? That's from a practical application perspective. From a research perspective, I think it's similar around what who's in that ecosystem. So who else might you partner with or um, work with or do that synthesis work? And, you know, sometimes we will write things into that, you know, um, more accessible guide style that Paul was talking about. And we'll be citing everyone else's work, but it's just something that actually the, there's been duplication of work in this, but actually none of it's very clear in terms of industry don't know what to do with it. So we'll just turn it into something that's usable and useful. So I think that that's, I think that's probably, you know, three sort of options. How do you kind of use the ecosystem to say who else is playing in here and how might we collaborate or who brings different valuable bits and how might we work together? Um, the second is, you know, how do you write something up so that you turn it into something that's more usable and useful? Um, and then the third would be around that activity-based piece in terms of, you know, the coalition of effort. How do you bring people together to have different kinds of conversations about 
that duplication and how you might work collectively for that shared purpose. I just going really, really way back down the chain to the, the knowledge creation part of it, you know, I think the duplication can be very good for a couple of reasons. One is obviously replication, especially when you're dealing with human social things, but anything behavioral, you know, we have a replication crisis, whether it's in behavioral economics or in social psychology or in evolutionary psychology. Some of the big things that we, you know, are written into all of Malcolm Gladwell's books, of course, don't replicate. So um, I would rather see, I tend to think the most strategic amount of money that anyone can spend on research is $10,000. I like small grants and I think that there should be lots of replication and this replication should be valued. So this is replication. I know you wanted to talk about duplication, but that kind of redundancy in the research ecosystem, I think, is really important. It might be a frustrating feature. It might be a little messy if you like things in boxes, but it's really important. And it's also very important because that's where the early career researchers really cut their teeth um, is, you know, in doing the small strategic things that they can possibly do. Um, as you get up to, to, you know, strategic initiatives, for instance, changing something about um, STEM education, of course, you know, we do have entire bureaucracies that are meant to be devoted to some kind of sensible education policy. But sometimes the ecosystems, you know, messy ecosystems are very productive ones. So, you know, th that's just not, not contradicting anything that Christy's just said, that there, there is also an upside to that mess that can, you know, can sometimes be a virtue. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd support both of those sets of comments. And I think actually Rob's pretty much summed it up for me as well. That there is an important role for replication, which can appear to be duplication, both in um, confirming our understanding, identifying context specific differences in populations or locations or environments, uh, um, but also in bringing people along in that knowledge creation process, which then leads to the adoption of the evidence much more quickly. Um, the the thing when it goes wrong and when it becomes duplication and and wastes of money um, can can be very frustrating and obviously you see that uh, especially when you have a, a federation of states and, and that kind of thing and I think there's a real role for researchers in reaching out and uh, building those local national and global networks. Uh, and sharing information and being prepared to just move quickly on from what someone else has learned. Uh, and I think we we enjoy doing that. Uh, it benefits our research profile, it benefits our citations, there's lots of incentives for doing it, but it also will avo avoid a lot of the duplication. Having a, a policy platform um, essentially in your back pocket where you go, I'm an expert in this area, I do research in this area, I've, I've written this meta-analysis, I've written that meta-analysis. I'm going to spend a day or two just writing out my own policy platform, what should change, what shouldn't change, and having it in, in your bench, you know, under your, under your bench or in your back pocket can be very, very useful because not only can you pull it out in those opportune moments when, you know, the rocket's just taken off and you've got a, an opportunity to change policy, but it also means that you can have something to um, bring to the national table, bring to the global table when you're working with your other um, colleagues and go, this is what I think needs to change in my part of the world. Are you feeling the same way? And those global networks of solidarity around evidence-based change that needs to happen um, are, the, are the basis on which we get global change, which is what we need and what you can see happening around the IPCC is a, is a huge example of where that's taken place and where the, that body has been able to change the way the world is working. So I'm going to, we're going to wrap up now so that we can close on time. Um, I want to ask you all one or possibly two because, Paul, you've probably, you've given us a whole host, so just think about your priority areas. What's one or two key takeaways if you've got people in the room who want to have more of an impact on policy, one or two things that you would do. Emma, you've, you've just given one away already, your policy platform. But um, from each of you, what's one or two takeaways that people could have around what they could do next? Uh, oh, um, I suppose it's uh, investment of of time in relationships with the people you're trying to influence. You know, um, people uh, will pay more attention. In fact, two, uh, 
too much if you're successful, too much attention to your information if you've built a good relationship with them. Yeah. So just a real quick one. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that it is messy and it's complicated, which means as an opportunity, as in a positive way of looking at it, um, you can play lots of different roles. You don't have to be the one writing the policy. You, you, there's so many actors. Think about where you want to be in that ecosystem and that will change through time. As you get more experience or as your relationships build, you can be a different player in the policy process at every time. And I've played lots of different roles and they're all very rewarding. Um, a little bit more abstract, but go and speak to people in other faculties. If you if you meet the people in law, they, they're all about this and just about all the time. The people in economics are usually very much about this and then uh, public health, for example. You know, I've been very lucky to meet a lot of people from across the university and the talent in terms of influencing different types of decision makers and different types of processes that we have in the university is profound. So um, you can learn a lot just by having those conversations. Come to Grand Challenges meetups. There's a plug. Um, I think those are all fabulous pieces of advice. I'm going to add two more. Um, one, talk to people who you don't agree with. And secondly, learn how to read a room and spend a lot of time listening. Look, uh, thank you for being here for the last uh, couple of hours. Um, thank you, Paul, for a really fabulous presentation. Um, thank you to Emma and Rob for joining me and Paul on the panel this afternoon. And thank you for your fabulous questions. What a great discussion. <laughs>